Uh, we're going to be in Ephesians uh, chapter 6, as I said. Uh, we're continuing our study uh, through the book of Ephesians. It's been a wonderful uh, study. We pray that God would be uh, merciful uh, tonight as we study God's Word. Um, let me begin in verse 5. I'm going to read all the way to verse 9 and really focus on just 5 through 8 uh, this evening. Hear the word of the Lord. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or is free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. Heavenly Father, I just ask now that you would speak through your servant for your good pleasure. I pray that you would help us see your truth and help us grow more in it. Father, I pray for a clarity of mind. I pray that you would take this offering, use it to strengthen and edify your people. I pray that you would allow it to fall on fertile soil that the people of God here would hear it, accept it, and bear fruit unto eternal life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, when we've been looking through the book of Ephesians, really, uh, those of you, kind of a quick recap on the book of Ephesians. The first three chapters, you just want to turn back to chapter 1. Uh, the first three chapters really all about the, uh, the, the, the doctrine of grace, how God saves his people. So chapter 1, uh, Paul unpacks the, really the, the, the trinity right there from verses 1 through uh, verse 14. That's one sentence in the Greek. You see this, the picture of Jesus and the Father and the, the Holy Spirit. And then he has this wonderful prayer. And then uh, chapter 2, he unpacks the gospel that we are uh, saved by grace uh, not of our own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no man may boast. For we are his workmanship, amen, creating Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. And then he unpacks the, this great mystery that God is going to take two people, the Jews and the, the Gentiles, and make them one people, that the, the wall of hostility has been broken down through the cross. Those who were near and those who were far have now been brought together in Christ. We see that really in chapter 2 and chapter 3, and then Paul prays again. And then in chapter 4, verse 1, it's kind of the second half. It's kind of the implications of the gospel. So the first half, this is the gospel. The second half of the book of Ephesians is this is the implication of the gospel. So in chapter uh, 4, it's, just, it's really general. This is what the new life in Christ looked like. We have the, the body of Christ, that we should be one body in Christ, that we should have uh, leaders, and we should have those leaders pouring their lives out into the church, and the church should be caring for and serving one another, and that, that unity that we have would bring us to maturity in Christ, that we would be like the Lord Jesus. The second half of chapter 4 is this, really what the body of Christ looked like. This is what you used to be. Uh, you put that off. And now you put on Christ. Uh, you put on gentleness. Uh, you put on generosity. Uh, you put on love. And you put off malice and anger and envy. And chapter uh, 5 is more of an implication, this charge on living in love with the body of Christ. And then really in chapter uh, 5, verse 22, he starts talking about the practical implications of life in relationships. So the, 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 the primary relationship that between a husband and a wife. How should a wife respond to a husband? How should a husband respond to a wife? And then as he goes on, he talks to, to children and how children should respond to their parents and how parents should disciple their, their children. Well, today it's the same thing, and he's, he's still in the household, which is important for us to understand because he's talking about uh, bond servants or slaves, right? In the, in the early century, we'll look at this in a second, about how slaves were part of the family unit in, in the ancient world. So just, just kind of maybe kind of a quick, before we dive into our text, just a quick survey of how, how slavery is talked about in, in the Bible. Uh, the, the Bible talks about slavery several places. There's some larger passages in the Old Testament, uh, specific, specifically in Exodus, uh, Leviticus, and, and Deuteronomy. 
Um, and just the, the slavery in, in the American context, when we typ typically think of slavery, we think of the kind of the chattel slavery where um, uh, human beings were treated as property, right? Uh, primarily because of the color of their skin. They were kidnapped. They were uh, taken from their homes, uh, primarily in, uh, in Africa and brought over on the, uh, with the slave trade. Um, the Bible condemns that in several places. In, in Exodus 21, 16, the Bible says, whoever steals a man and sells him, and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. So slavery in the Bible, in the Old Testament, if anyone robbed someone and it like stole someone who was a free person, that person should be put to death. It says basically the same thing in Deuteronomy 24, 17. In kidnapping another man and making him a slave, that is punishable by death. The Bible is very strong in that language. And yet in the Bible, the Bible does not often picture slavery in the same way as maybe we think about it in our American context. Um, it talks about uh, slavery in, in some ways as an opportunity to be a blessing to others, right? Uh, so, for example, uh, if someone is caught stealing and someone can't pay their debt or can't make restitution because of their, because of their theft, they were allowed to be a, a, a slave for a time, right? And again, this is very different than the kind of slavery that we're thinking about in the American context. Um, other people could say, I can't pay my bills. I, can't, I have debts that I cannot pay. So they can voluntarily uh, indenture themselves as servants to someone, right? So it was a voluntary uh, decision. Uh, some could look at having the, the during the time uh, in, the, in the ancient world, the, during the year of Jubilee, the seventh year, and then uh, the, every 50th year that everyone who was a slave was called to be, to be made free. Uh, slaves could make the choice to choose to be slaves for life. Now, remember, it was their choice, very different than the slavery that we see in our culture. In Deuteronomy chapter 23, it says that a slave could free, uh, flee an oppressive master if they were mistreated, and they would be able to find a sol asylum and protection in another place. Uh, slaves uh, in, in, in the Bible um, would have a choice on when to leave uh, after six years. Uh, they would have the so Sabbath day off. Right? They would be called, just like the Israelites were, to, to work six days and have the seventh day off. We see that in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. Uh, masters uh, who punished, uh, were punished for mistreating slaves. So, for example, if, if, a, if a slave was struck by their master and damaged their eye, that slave would be allowed to go free. Uh, slaves were considered a part of the household. And in the ancient world, that they, weren't even, uh, they were even able to own property. And in many cases, they would be able to have an inheritance from their, their master, uh, Genesis uh, 24, 2. Now, when we think about slavery, and in, in, in even in our own denomination, uh, the historical roots of slavery within the Southern Baptist Convention, the Southern Baptist Convention was founded trying to defend slavery in the American South. That's abhorrent. It's awful, right, that that's how our denomination was, was birthed. Right? It started in 1861, should a slave uh, holder, slave owner, be allowed to be a missionary? And that's how our denomination started. So we have a very kind of bad track record uh, as, as a denomination when it looked at the issue of, of slavery. Um, and yet the slavery that we're talking about here is not very similar to the slavery that we're talking about uh, that we maybe remember from the American South, right? Uh, it's hard to kind of process that. Now, they're all often... Um, uh, there were bad slave owners in the ancient world. Uh, there were, uh, you know, awful stories of, of how slaves were treated in the ancient world. Um, but here in this passage, Paul is not talking about the institution of slavery, right? He's not trying to make a point. This is how we interact with the institution of slavery. He's trying to address Christians who are slaves. Now, hear me. They are spoken of in the body of Christ as fellow believers. The fact that they were addressed assumes that slaves were Christians and they were treated as part of the family of faith. They were called to be mature believers in, in Christ. They were called to be loved. They are, they are one people, right? So this is, this is very uh, unique uh, to the ancient world, right, in terms of how these, these brothers and sisters were truly brothers and sisters of the same family. So, there's much we could say about slavery in the Bible, but really just want to focus on this text. Uh, so let's look at verse uh, 5. So it says, bond servants. Again, Paul is not addressing um, culture here largely. He's really not even addressing, hey, how do we make issues in society? What he is addressing is how are you, as a slave, living your life as a Christian? 
right? And this whole section, when he talks about wives and children, uh, he, ta- he addresses those who are called to be in submission first, and then he addresses those who are in authority. So next week, we're going to kind of talk about those uh, who are in authorities, the master. Uh, m- most scholars, when they look at this passage, they, they think more of how do we look at um, kind of a boss-employee relationship, right? That's many which probably more similar to what, what kind of slavery looked like in the ancient world, and yet it's still not that way because there were still more restrictions on slaves. So, um, you know, what I think Paul would say is God is going to judge those who are outside in society. God is going to judge the world. He mentions that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that God is going to judge them. But in the church, this is how we should live. If you are a Christian and you happen to be a slave, this is how you should live. If you are a, 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 a master of slave, this is how you should live. If you are a Christian wife, a Christian husband, a Christian father, a Christian uh, son or daughter, this is how you should live. So Paul is addressing those in the audience. So we want to look first at what Paul charges them to is a godly obedience, a godly obedience. So it says, bond servants or slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ. Uh, Beloved, we all have those who are over us in the Lord, right? We have those who are over us at our jobs. Uh, We have those who are over us in society, right? So we have uh, mayors, we have governors, we have presidents, we have those who are over us, right, in, in, in the church. We have, we have elders who are over those who are, who are members. We all have that. If you have a job, most likely you have a boss who you are responsible to. You are going to answer to them. Um, so the question is not if we are going to have people over us, but how do we respond? How do we submit to those who are over us. You know, if you look back to the fall in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve failed in their submission to God's authority. God gave them a good word to obey, and they chose not to obey it and ushered sin into the world. How we respond to the authority over us really is often an indicator, right, of how we respond and submit to the Lord. Uh, now, and we know very clearly that if anyone uh, who's over you calls you into sin, calls you to do something that is against the Word of God, that's where submission stops, right? You don't follow anyone into sin. You, will fo- you follow the Lord, and then you follow those who are over you. But if God has placed people over you, and even if you don't fully agree, but if it's not sinful, the, the, the thrust of the Bible is that you should follow that authority. And beloved, that is, that is something that is very uh, under attack today, the idea of just submitting to any authority is often under attack. But look what the text says. It says, Obey your earthly master with fear and trembling. Honor and respect is what, what, what the, the sense is. For those who are over, you shouldn't just obey and do what is, is asked of you. No, you should do it in a way that it shows fear and trembling, honor and respect. He goes on to say, you should do this with a sincere heart. You should be real and, and genuine. You shouldn't be hypocritical. So maybe just this, this week, right, check your own heart. And just ask yourself, how often do you complain about your supervisor at work? How often are you critical of the decisions made by, by your pastors? How often are you, are you critical and, and judging uh, the governor, the, the mayor, the, the president? Now, is it, does it mean you can never speak against those who are in power? Absolutely not. But I think more often than not, we don't have a natural bent towards submission. We have a natural bent to to challenge and condemn those who are in authority. Why? Because we want to be the authority. We don't want to submit. We don't want to honor. We don't want to do this in fear and trembling. Beloved, we want to honor those who are over us. This is a a sign of, of our submission to God's providence in our lives. We trust that God has ordained leaders, even if they're leaders that we don't fully agree with. Do your work well. Labor hard. I think this is the, 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 the idea where Paul is, is going. Because that's really all we can control. And we, we know this in life, right? You can't control anybody in your life. You can't control how somebody else treats you, right? But what did Jesus say? You do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You treat them in a certain manner regardless of what they deserve. Because we treat people better than we deserve. Why? Because God treated us better than we deserve. Right? We deserve nothing but damnation. 
We deserve nothing but condemnation from a holy God because of our sin. And God reached out and gave us grace and gave us mercy. So because God gave us grace and gave us mercy, we should respond in kind to those in our lives. Because remember, some of the slaves that are being mentioned are those who chose to be slaves. They voluntarily made that decision. Some made that decision because they had no other choice, whether because they, they, were, they were stealing and they had to do this to pay back the debt that they stole. Uh, some were doing this and, um, because they, they had situations that come up in their life that they couldn't pay. Now, those in the church would not be those who would have been stolen because that would have been against God's word very clearly. So, number one, we see this godly obedience, but then we see this godly motivation, this godly motivation. Let's look at what the text says. It says, we should obey your earthly master with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. As you would Christ. Beloved, how has Christ treated you. Christ has been patient with you. Christ laid down his life to pay for your sins. Not just your respectable sins. All your sins. He laid down his life for them. He conquered the grave for you. So now as we think about our own coming death, we have no fear because Christ has overcome the grave. He shouted victory for us. He sent the Holy Spirit to us to dwell inside. So we have the very presence of God with us, sent to us by Christ. All the trials, all the persecutions that we will ever deal with in our life, the Lord Jesus Christ will carry us. He will sustain us. Why? Because he said, I am your Emmanuel. God with us. He leads us. He leads you to this place, to this gathering. He leads you to your jobs. He leads you to your family. He leads you, and then he refines you with different things in your life. He, he disciplines you. He, he, he moves out the rough edges and smooths them out so that you can become a better reflection of, of Christ. We also see that we're called to be the Lord's witness. If you go through the New Testament and you read all the different kind of passages that mentions slavery. You can go to Col uh, Colossians chapter um, 3. You can go to Titus chapter, uh, chapter 2, uh, which Titus has this great kind of picture of what we're, we're called to testify, right? And this is whether you're a slave or whether you're free, uh, whether you're oppressed or whether you're um, going through a trial, persecution, whatever it is, you are called to be a witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. You are called to adorn or make beautiful the gospel of God, our Savior. This is what Paul writes to, to Titus. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, that not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior. We want to live our lives in such a way. So now, just think about this as employees. You want to be the kind of employee at your jobs that people look at you and say, why do you work so hard? Why are you so diligent? Why are you so faithful? Because of Christ. Why don't you complain and everybody else around me is complaining about what's going on? Because of Christ. Do people, do, do people smell the, the aroma of Christ on you? Or do, do you look like everybody else? You are called for overtime, so you are the one complaining that you have to, have to work. Your boss makes a decision, and you're the ones who kind of bubble up and start complaining and chitter-chatter with your other colleagues. Or are you the ones who adorn, make beautiful the gospel of God, our Savior? I wonder how many times in these last days Christians are asking themselves, right, before they hit send, before they hit post, or before they hit like, do they say, does this adorn the gospel of God, my Savior? Would Jesus Christ, my Savior and my Lord, be pleased with me if I did this, if I tweeted this, if I posted this? I wonder how many realize that we are going to give an account to a holy God and how we stewarded our witness. And I don't know those here, but I know largely from what I heard of, of 
other pastors, um, just general things that I've heard in social media, right, about those who are handling themselves. Christians, I don't think the reputation is adorning the gospel of God our Savior. Now, hear me. That doesn't mean don't say anything. Do you feel me? You got you to be responsible for what you say before holy God, okay? But don't, don't, don't mishear me, right? Speak what is good and right, but do it in a manner that makes the gospel beautiful because Jesus is beautiful. Jesus is so good to us, beloved. And look what he promises. Look what the text says not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with good will as to the Lord, not to men. He says the same thing. He repeats himself, right? We're living, serving for the Lord. He says the same thing in Colossians chapter 3, right? But look at verse 8. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord whether he's a bondservant or free. So yes, the, you, you may think that you're a slave and you have no power. You may think that you're poor and you have no power. You may think that you are, are, are on, the, on the bottom rung of society, that you have no power, but you don't need to know this, that the work that you do for the Lord, the good that you do, the Lord God Almighty sees. He sees your labor. He sees you enduring insult for the cross. He sees you not posting anything and, and holding your tongue. He sees you bearing with another, another, another slanderous remark. He sees you being kind and patient with someone who does not deserve it. He sees it, and he will reward you. That's our God. The God that we serve has promised us whatever you do for his namesake, he sees and he will reward you. Beloved, living life in a fallen world is hard. I mentioned this in the sermon, but there's just been days of late hearing of people's sickness, hearing of people's struggle with this virus, hearing the angst that people have with the lack of justice in our world, people battling and confessing sin, I just have thrown up my hands and say, Lord, when will you come back? When will you come back? And there's been a part of me that just has, has wanted to, to kind of throw your hands up and just say, I'm done. Lord, I'm not sure I got much more left in me. Will you please come back? I mean, I'm sure some of you have been there, maybe even this past week. And then we hear those words, do not weary in well-doing. The Lord sees it. The Lord knows your heart. And he has promised he will reward you. And one day, when our time is called and we stand before a, a holy God, he will say, well done. Well done, good and faithful slave. Good and faithful servant. Take your reward and enter the joy of your master. Beloved, let us live here on earth as slaves of the Lord Jesus. Let us live as servants of the most high God. No matter what we do, what we, what we say, how we live, let us adorn the gospel of God our Savior. Father, I pray people in this congregation would live in such a way to adorn the gospel of God, our Savior. Use this message to refine us, to grow us, to help us become more like Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.